Allah is the feminine of Allah. So uh, the, the goddess par excellence. So while you have a male moon god, in this case, you have a female sun god. So that's Allah. You may know these three goddesses thanks to the satanic verses, because the satanic verses is inspired on a scene in the life of Muhammad, where in the beginning of his career, he's still quite powerless and nobody wants to go with him. Nobody believes his, his pretense of prophethood. And so he thinks of a compromise. Maybe the Arabs, pagans can continue to worship their beloved three goddesses. The exalted birds is what they are called. And um, as long as they keep accepting him as a prophet, So we're going to talk about shirk. The pronunciation is shirk, not shirk, as the English word shirk for, you know, to avoid something. So it is shirk. Um, and if you know a little bit about Islamic terminology, you will know the term. Uh, so shirk uh, means something like idolatry, polytheism. And... Um, so originally it is a perfectly respectable part of religion in uh, the Middle East. So dingir is a Sumerian word for originally star. It depicts a star, but coming to mean God. So a deity, a God, originally is a, a star. So you have the same semantic development in Indo-European, where the root div, shine, yields the word deva which means God, or the Latin word Deus, which means a God, or the Germanic word Tivas, um, which you find back in the word Tuesday. Then a derived root with essentially the same meaning, Diev, yields Diaus, which means the sky God, uh, Greek Zeus, uh, Latin Jov, like Jupiter, Jov Peter, Dios Pitar, so Father Heaven. You have a derived Sanskrit word, high Sanskrit, Diauti, which means Prakrit, but it's also Prakritized already in the Veda itself. Jyoti, whence you have words like Jyotisha, which means astronomy, like uh, you have a Vedanga Jyotisha, which is a manual of astronomy. It has nothing to do with what is now called, or very little to do, with what is now called astrology, meaning uh, deriving predictions uh, from stellar positions. Uh, but so it has acquired that meaning gradually. Okay, um, an astrologer is not only called a Jyotishi, but another word is a Daivajnya, a knower of the gods, a knower of destiny. So here again, you have this equivalence between star and, and God. Then in Semitic, you have a similar development. Um, ilu or il, which strictly means powerful, also comes to be written with this uh, Sumerogram Dingir, which is a God. Uh, whence you have the Hebrew word El, Hebrew being also a Semitic language. So El, meaning God, which you have in many names. Everybody knows the word because it appears in names like Gabriel, which means my strength is God. Uriel, my light is God. Raphael, God heals. Or Michael, which means who is like God. It has a really profound name. Then uh, you have a derivative, Eloha which means a deity, and of that you have a plural Elohim, which originally seems to have meant the gods. By the time of the Bible, it simply means God. It's an honorific plural. And um, the related Arabic word is Ilah, which means a deity, 
And this term you might know if you know something about Akbar. Akbar founded his own religion, Dini Ilahi, which he conceived as a Ganga Yamuni Tehzib, as a confluence, you know, taking the best from Islam and Hinduism. Uh, and so he called this Dini Ilahi, the divine religion. Now, from this Ilah, you have, uh, yeah, not really a derivative, a, a construct, Al Ilaha, which means the God. And that word is more colloquially known as Allah. So Allah means the God. It doesn't specifically mean the one God of Islam. Muhammad's father already was called Abdullah, the servant of Allah. So the term Allah was already used. And so could be used for any God or for an important God. And so in, in Mecca, this was the God Hubal. The, um, uh, he was a masculine moon God, somewhat like uh, Shiva. Shiva the Chandradhara, the carrier of the moon. Um, this, uh, this word Ilah, you also find in the name Ilahabad, which the British wrongly transcribed as Allahabad. So Ilahabad means the divine city. And so it's a city created by, um, by Akbar himself, because this city was located on the confluence of the Ganga and the Yamuna. And so it was the perfect symbol for his Dini Ilahi, which was conceived as a confluence of Hinduism and Islam. In China, you have again a similar uh, development. One word I won't say for God, but for the divine is Shangti, which means the powers on high, which can be conceived both as the stars and the ancestors. And so Shangti is more or less the, the ultimate ancestor, the ancestor of all ancestors. When the Protestant missionaries arrived in China, they took this word to translate the biblical word God, or Yahweh, which the Confucians in China contested because Shangti never indicates the creator of the universe. In fact, the whole idea of creation of the universe is not at all universal, it's typically biblical. Uh, but so the Protestant missionaries took the word Shangti to mean the creator. Uh, they were perhaps insufficiently aware that in Chinese, there is not strictly a separate form for the plural. So Shangti can mean God, but it can just as well mean gods. It can just as well be plural which would be a great heresy for those missionaries. Then you have another word, Tian, uh, which means heaven. It is less personal, it is more abstract. It was introduced in China by the Zhou dynasty in the 11th century BC. And um, so I wonder, I, I will not put it as a hypothesis, but it's a little speculation I have whether the word is related to the Mongol and Turkish word Tengri, which also means heaven. And so the Zhou dynasty that introduced this, they were originally the vassals of the Shang emperor and they held the Western frontier against the barbarians from the steppe against the Mongols. And so um, they clearly were more in close contact with those barbarians. And so maybe the word has its origin there, but this is just speculation. Anyway, when the Catholic missionaries came into China, they took this word, but to make it more personal, they added the, the word Ju, which means the boss. So Tianzhu is the heavenly boss, the boss in heaven. Another important Chinese concept here is Tao, which means the way, or Tian Tao, the way of heaven. So this indicates the path of the stars across heaven. So every night you see them rise in the east and make their way to the west. 
So that's the image of natural law, of what in India is called artha. And um, there is uh, a little uh, saying that you may want to memorize, yi yin, yi yang, zhe wei tao. This means one yin and one yang, that is called the way. One shadowy element and one bright element, that is called the way. Or more colloquially, a right one and a left one, that's how it advances. Now, let's advance uh, in the science of God. So, the biblical name for God is either Elohim, as we just discussed, or Yahweh. Now, where does Yahweh appear? Abraham didn't know about Yahweh. He only appears to Moses a number of generations later. So what happened to Moses? He grew up in the court of the Pharaoh in Egypt. Then at some point he commits murder and he's found out. And so he flees. He runs away to the desert and he stays with the Midianite Bedouins who are Arabs. Then one fine day he is out in the desert and he sees a burning bush, a bush catching fire. This is a natural phenomenon. It's this, um, these etheric uh, gases that emanate from, from the plant, from the, burning, from the bush. And under the hot sun rays, this catches fire. And so the bush itself seems to be burning. So if you're not used to this, you might see something divine in this. And so Moses being at that time uh, busy with theological questions, probably he had learned about monotheism at the court of the Pharaoh. This is where around the same time uh, Echnaton appears, the first monotheist. So this question of, uh, of the nature of God occupies him a lot. And so he sees God appearing there. And uh, God says, take off your shoes, you are on holy ground. Notice as Hindus that the custom of taking off your shoes uh, out of respect is not typically or exclusively Indian. So this is what uh, this, uh, this being, this voice tells Moses to do. Okay, so then they start talking and um, Moses is impressed and he says, okay, I, I, I want to tell the people about you, but whom shall I say that I've seen here? And so God himself answers, Eheye asher eheye, which means literally, I am who I am. Now, this can have the meaning, I am whoever I choose to be. Don't ask me to pigeonhole myself, to give myself a certain label. No, whatever I am, that's what I am. I owe you no explanation. But there's another more philosophical meaning. I am the one who is, who necessarily is. I am the one whose essence is existence. Later theologians will use this phrase among the proofs of God's existence. They say, okay, it is part of the essence of God that he exists. It's not part of your essence. There was a day when, let's say, our host Tanya did not exist yet, even though in the mind of God, she was already there, but she did not exist yet. Now she exists. Unfortunately, a day will come when she will cease to exist. Yet she still has an essence. You can write books about her. You know, you can describe her character and, and her doings and so on. So she has an essence, but at that point, no existence anymore. Well, God is the one who necessarily exists. He is eternal. At least that's one deduction you can make from it. Now, unfortunately, this is all based on a folk etymology. Why? Well, the word Yahweh 
can be analyzed as a, um, a form of the same verb as eheye. Uh, so it's a root haya, haya, um, which means to be. So the meaning here is he is, or Yahweh is he who is, but actually it is not from that root. And so around 1900, one of the great orientalists, Julius Wellhausen, gave another analysis. He said, you see, this is an Arabic word from a root that doesn't exist in Hebrew, that exists in Arabic. It appears also in the Quran, for instance, namely from a verb hawa, not haya, but hawa, which means to move in the sky. So it can mean to blow, like the wind is blowing. And so in the desert, you have storms, you have sandstorms. This is a new phenomenon for an Egyptian. You see, if you live along the Nile, you have an extremely stable climate where it practically never rains, where it's always sunshine. So the, uh, the desert is a, is a different climate. So there you have the storm god who has a job somewhat like, like Indra in India. Um, it can also mean to swoop down. That's also a movement that happens above you. Like there's an eagle flying and he sees a prey animal downstairs. And so he swoops down to the ground level and takes his prey with him. Uh, that's also an image of God in the sense that uh, God can suddenly do things with you. If something happens in your life, you can conceive of it as an intervention by God. So the real meaning of Yahweh is he who moves in the sky, he who does things in the sky, which incidentally can also be said about the stars. Because what do the stars do? Well, they move in the sky from east to west. Then you have another word for God that you might know is the Greek word theos which yields, for instance, the um, English word uh, theology or names like um, Theodore. So theos comes from a root thesos. So in Greek, at some point, these um, S sounds between two vowels disappear. So thesos, the root is tes. This comes from an Indo-European root des. Uh, you might know it, though perhaps not recognize it, from a Latin derivative, festus. You see, the Latins, the Romans, uh, were a bit careless with the proper pronunciation of complicated sounds. And so the d, they turn into f. It's like what some people do when they speak English. You see, the thief, they make it do the thief, you know, f thief. Uh, whatever, so it's something like that. Des is turned into fes or fas. Fas means good fortune. Festus means a day of, you know, of, of reverence, a holy day. Where from feriae, originally feziae, feriae means the holidays. In Germanic, you have a derivative dis, which means goddess. And so among the classes of different deities in Germanic mythology, you have the Aesir, uh, related with the Sanskrit word Asura. You have the Vanir, and so you also have the Disir, the goddesses. In modern Scandinavian, this simply means woman. Like, for instance, there is a, a girl's name, Vigdis, which happens to be the uh, name of my second daughter. So vig means fast or combative. This simply means woman. In Sanskrit, you have a root disha or an, a word disha, which means daring or enthusiastic. And where from you get a word dhishana, which means a goddess, or dhishnya, um, an adjective meaning uh, devoted to God. And it also means the planet of Venus. Then you have some more words for God. Um, you have in Slavic, Bog, like in the name Bogdan, gift of God. So Bog is related to Sanskrit Bhaga, 
Bhaga is share, a part, or the share giver, hence the dispenser of destiny. Like in, uh, in the anthem, Bharata Bhagya Vidhata. So the Bhagya is a derivative from this Bhaga, share, destiny. And then you have the Germanic word gold, which also has a cognate in Sanskrit, namely Huta. Huta, that which is worshipped. And so the word gold originally refers to anything that is worshipped. It's only the Christian missionaries, when they came, they shifted the meaning a bit to meaning their own one God. Now, it's about time we get to, uh, to explain the word shirk. So in Semitic, shirk means association. Like um, you have a derived word sharik in Arabic, which means an associate, a, a companion. So here in, uh, in Ugaritic, which is uh, an old city located in Western Syria, near the coast. And so there they spoke the same language as in, as in Israel, as in the surrounding areas. And so in this Ugaritic, uh, you have a word shirk with the meaning of associating a deceased hero with a star. So when an important person, especially after his death, as long as he's still alive, he can still do anything, do, do something wrong. He can still fall from grace. But so when he's dead, you see the full measure of his importance is taken. And he becomes part of the collective consciousness, just like the starry sky. And so he's identified with one of the stars. That way he becomes immortal. Well, actually, the stars are not really immortal, but they take a few billions of years. So by human standards, that's pretty much immortal. He achieves undying fame. Now, this is a not so special thing, you know, that we all practice. Like um, when your father dies, uh, you take your little son on, a, on an evening walk. And you tell him, you know, he's sad that grandfather has died. You tell him, no, 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 no. Granddad continues to live. Look at that star there. That's him. He's watching over you. Now make sure you behave because he can see you. And so you see this on a, in a more formal, grander scale is essentially the same phenomenon. And so it unites it fuses the two main original forms of religion, which is heaven worship and ancestor worship. So the ancestors can't really affect you anymore. They can't beat you anymore, but in a subtle way, they still influence you. The same thing is said by astrologers about the stars. The stars can't really do anything but they have a subtle influence that still shapes your destiny. Okay, so um, you have a number of uh, related cultures where you have the same phenomenon, like uh, among the pharaohs. Uh, among the oldest generations, it was indeed similarly said that uh, a deceased pharaoh was identified with a specific star. Later, they, um, they simplify it and they say that once a pharaoh has, has died, he has gone with Ra, he has gone with the sun. In later times, this is uh, more or less transformed into a kind of monotheism in the sense that all the stars identified with all the ancestors, worship the sun. So the many gods become subordinate to the one god. The uh, pharaoh Pepi of uh, early Egypt uh, is described as having become Rigal, the main star in Orion. So this practice existed um, that 
kings are associated with any specific star after death. Right, well, this, um, this divinization of the stars is pretty common, like uh, Plato explicitly uh, considered the stars as divine. Although by the time of the um, Greek philosophers, there were also dissenting voices like Aristagoras and Aristophanes are, are skeptics or what is in India called rationalists. And to them, you see no gold business. For them, the stars are only fiery rocks, which is more or less the modern idea. So Plato also says that after death, everybody becomes a star. This is what is called apotheosis, deification. That is to say, elevation to a divine state or elevation to a star. So many characters in Greek mythology are in that way uh, elevated to divine status like Perseus, like Argo, like, uh, you know, there is a constellation Argo, which means the ship Argo. And so you see, once that ship had gained fame th through the myths about it, it is elevated into the sky. And so uh, a constellation is identified with it. So there's also a constellation Perseus. There's a constellation Orion. There is a star called Ganymede um in aquarius so aquarius is the um the server the um the waiter of the gods and that's also the role of ganymede in mythology uh zeus also had a love affair with him maybe that's also why he deserved to be up there uh, another lover of zeus callisto uh, she is identified with the great bear. Then there is another um, lover boy of an emperor. Emperor Hadrian had this, uh, this boy, um, Antinous. And so when Antinous grows up and he gets a uh, masculine uh, beard and so on, he realizes that his time as the imperial lover boy is over and he commits suicide he drowns himself and emperor hadrian is very sad and so he to always be able to look at him he puts him in the sky the same principle but without any physical stars is applied by emperors caesar and august when they put their own name in the calendar they identify themselves with the month of the year so that all the time you are forced to keep on thinking of them, to remember them. Then uh, in the Vedas, you have the same idea that people go to the sky. And indeed, there is a Vedic ritual where the priest points out where the souls of the dead go. So there's a specific area in the sky in, in the region of Scorpio uh, Sagittarius uh, where the dead supposedly go. Uh, note, by the way, that the planets in Hinduism uh, do not have a mythological name. So in, in, in Latin and uh, the derived languages, uh, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and so on are names of gods. This is not the case in, uh, in India. Pole star is called Dhruva, which simply means static. Uh, among the planets Shani, means slow and indeed it's the slowest of the planets saturn guru means heavy and jupiter is indeed the heaviest among the planets um, then mangala is mars contrary to what you expect if you do astrology mangala means beneficent pleasant and that has to do with the fact that mars is red in color the red color is the festive color like is the, the color worn by a bride. Shukra means white, and Venus indeed is white. Buddha means awakening, and indeed Mercury is the star closest to the sun, 
So when it rises, it's always very near the horizon. And then later when the sun is up, you can't see it anymore. Then Chandra means of silver or brilliant, which is the moon. So they all have a very uh, naturalistic name, not a mythological name. That was just uh, an intermezzo. You have the principle of Shirk. In the case of the star Canopus, Canopus in Sanskrit is called Agastya, after the seer who went south. Canopus is the, the brightest star in the southern hemisphere. You have the seven sages, the Saptarshi, that's the name of the great bear. Among them you have a couple of Asista and his wife Arundhati, who are the stars Mizar and Alkor in the great bear. Then the last sign of life of the principle of Shirk, already in the modern age, at least in the 17th century. At that time, um, discoverers uh, map out the stars in the southern hemisphere. And so among them, you have uh, the Mons Mensai table mount, named after a specific mountain, very visible in Cape Town in South Africa. And another constellation there is called Scutum Sobieski, the shield of Sobieski, which is after the Polish king Jan Sobieski, who defends and saves the city of Vienna from a siege by the Ottoman Empire. Of course, out of sensitivity later, the name Sobieski was dropped. It simply became Scutum not to offend our Muslim friends. Another case of shirk is uh, the uh, name of Uranus once it was discovered, namely Sidus Georgium, the star of King George of England, uh, who was the, uh, the patron, the sponsor of the discoverer, who was a uh, German who had settled in England, William Herschel. But then you see afterwards, you know, when he had passed, the planet was uh, named after him, Herschel, or it was given more classically uh, a mythological name, Uranus, by which it is still known today. Then you have an extension of the principle of Shirk, where there are no real stars involved anymore, but there are gods involved, Vishnu and Shiva correspond vaguely to the solar and the lunar principle. And so it is Vishnu who is mostly worshipped, not as such, but through his incarnations. So uh, two, and in fact more, but two are best known uh, human beings are after their death uh, identified with Shiva or seen as an... Uh, um, an incarnation or avatara, strictly speaking, is a um, descent. You see, they are Shiva in who has come descending to earth. So this is uh, this is you know avatar incarnation is really also the principle of shirk. It's identifying a human being, Rama or Krishna, with Vishnu. This is quite similar to the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus is supposed to be God incarnate. He is God become human. The difference, of course, is that Vishnu is, a, what shall I say, not a polygamist, but um, a polyincarnationist. So he comes through uh, Rama and Krishna, but also Kalki and the Buddha and Vamana and so on. He has a number of incarnations whereas Jesus is the only one. Then you find elements of shirk in the original astrocentric sense of the epithets of the Virgin Mary. You know, the Virgin Mary has a litany. A litany is what you have in Sanskrit as the um, Vishnu Sahasranama. Lalita Sahasranama and so on, a long list of names describing the qualities of a particular God. So you also have a list of Mary 
And so among these epithets are Queen of Heaven and Morning Star. And so these are names of Venus. She is taken up into heaven. This is the Christian uh, feast of the Assumption. She doesn't ascend to heaven herself. Only Jesus can do that. But she's taken up into heaven. She's assumed on the 15th of August. So that's a literal case of apotheosis. You know, she's projected up in the world of the gods. When you look at the names of the constellations, in most cultures, they show no sign of shirk. Like in China, you see the emperors are not identified with a star. Only in general, the emperor as an institution uh, is linked to heaven. Namely, he's called Tianzi, which means the son of heaven. But that's a title that all of them have. People don't usually succeed in eternalizing themselves through shirk. Like I mentioned, this pharaoh Apepi, who was identified with the star uh, Orion, uh, or the constellation Orion. Well, you see, if you look up at the sky, you look at Orion or star Regal, you don't think of Pepe. In fact, you probably never heard of him. And so most great figures like Pharaoh Ramses or Alexander the Great or Genghis Khan and so on, don't bother putting their name among the stars. Uh, here in my uh, PowerPoint, I see a little mistake. The name Charles, Charles's Wayne, that is sometimes used to depict uh, or to, to design, to designate uh, the, the great bear. Uh, actually, that is not named for a certain Charles. That's what it looks like, but it's not exactly the case. It is actually from Charles Wayne. A churl means a, a lad, a guy, a bloke. Um, you know, a young man, able-bodied, and so a churl's wain, the, the, the wagon of the man, means the great bear, and um, the little bear, Ursa Minor, that is the, uh, the women's wain, okay? So the man's wain is the, the great bear, and the woman's is the, the little bear. Anyway, so um, it rarely catches on. And so new generations forget about it. You see, a person remains famous among those who have known him. But after that, the memory fades away, mostly. In India, too, um, this is a, a practice that has gone into disuse. One factor is that the doctrine of reincarnation became generalized. So your ancestors can't be identified anymore with the star because they've come down again. Also, once you understand the mechanics of the, the starry sky, then the divine status of the stars becomes less credible. The Bible uh, doesn't like star worship, and uh, it insists that the stars are just creatures. You know, fairly long-lived creatures, but nevertheless creatures. They're not God. However, the Bible allows you, Hindus, to, um, to practice star worship. The Bible says explicitly that you, Israelites, should not worship sun, moon, and stars. You know, you should not look up to them because you'll be led astray and start worshiping them and serving them. And you shouldn't do that. But all the nations under heaven, all the non-Israelites, they can do this. But so the idea is that any creature uh, should not be taken to be the creator. And uh, therefore, the sin against God is to bring him down to the level of his creatures which you do by identifying creatures with him. In um, the civilization that preceded Islam, 
you uh, similarly have a stellar cult. And thanks to Salman Rushdie, everybody knows uh, perhaps the most conspicuous part of it, namely the three goddesses of Mecca. Uh, male moon god, like Hubal in Mecca, or like Shiva in India, is typically depicted with three women. These women may be called his wives or his daughters or his lovers or even his mothers. Like in, in the Vedas, you have uh, the Murtyunjaya mantra, which says, Triambakam Yajamahe. Now, Triambakam is mostly translated as the three-eyed one, which is Shiva. But it can also be analyzed as the one with the three mothers. Amba means mother. So um, in South Asia and in a very large part of the world, mother is a very normal word for women in general. So his, his three women uh, in the Vedas, they are called Gungu, Siniwala, and Raka. And so they indicate the three phases of the moon, the waxing moon, the full moon, and the waning moon. And so here in Arabia, you have the same thing, Hubal, the moon, has three daughters, um, Al-Uzza, al and al Manat, And so they are the three phases of the lunar cycle. They are also identified with Venus, with the sun, and with the moon as indicator of, the, uh, of destiny. al is the feminine of Allah, so uh, the, the goddess par excellence. So... While you have a male moon god, in this case, you have a female sun god. So that's a lot. You may know these three goddesses thanks to the satanic verses, because the satanic verses is inspired on a scene in the life of Muhammad, where in the beginning of his career, he's still quite powerless, and nobody wants to go with him. Nobody believes his, his pretense of prophethood. And so he thinks of a compromise. Maybe the Arabs, pagans, can continue to worship their beloved three goddesses. The exalted birds is what they are called. And um, as long as they keep accepting him as a prophet, then they can practice their polytheism. But the few converts that he already had pointed out to him that this was not logical, that they themselves, before converting, had to disown the gods that they used to worship. And uh, Muhammad understands, yeah, you know, this, this I, I can't keep this up, so I have to make people disown these goddesses. And But he had had a revelation from Allah that, it was okay to worship these three goddesses. And then he rationalized this, explained it away by saying, well, yes, but it was not God who told me this. It's the devil, it's Satan who whispered this into my ear. And then he receives new revelations that condemn these goddesses. Yeah, so Allah, let's return to this term Allah. So it's a, a pre-Islamic term. It is generic for a god, or in this case, the god, meaning the special god, the god who towers over all the others. It can mean the Deus Otiosus, the god who does nothing, the god who has taken vacation, after having, you know, created the world and so on. He's at the top of the pantheon. Uh, you have something similar in the Catholic religion where, you know, God doesn't normally do anything. You don't really pray to God except to, to praise him. But if you are in need of something, if you pray for, you know, uh, a cure for your disease or for, you know, help in your uh, state of poverty or whatever, you pray to the Virgin Mary and she intercedes. You see, she's a, a whole uh, rung lower than God himself. And so here, similarly, 
the actual praying is done to lower deities, especially these daughters of Hubal or of, of Allah. So at any rate, in Mecca, Allah is the epithet of the God that is worshipped there, namely Hubal or Dhu Shara, is another name of the same God. So this corresponds to Shiva or in, in the Middle East to Baal. In the Bible, Yahweh often has as his enemy Baal, the horned God. The horned God, um, often depicted as a bull, like the golden calf, or like Nandi, is horned because you can see the moon crescents. And so if you go closer to the equator, you see the moon lying flat. You see, where I'm talking here in Belgium, the moon is more upstanding. And so down there, it is more flat. And so it looks like the horns of a bull. So that's the horned goat. Nowadays in the West, you have this phenomenon, Wicca, the neo-witches. So they worship the horned god and the triple goddess. That's the same principle, uh, the moon god and his three consorts. And so the moon god presides over the Kaaba and the black stone. The father of Muhammad was called Abdullah, which is the, uh, the servant of the god. The Muslims reinterpreted this um, Allah and made him into the Arabic translation of, uh, of Yahweh, of the biblical God, the one God. So um, what Muhammad does is uh, he acts against the cult of the stars. In the Quran, three times the star cult is uh, condemned. One is in a story about Abraham who gives up sun worship. He used to worship the sun, then he turns to the creator of the sun. And there's also a story that Abraham destroyed the idols that were produced by his father. His father was a craftsman, a sculptor, who made idols. And so Abraham turns against this, which is why in, in Muslim parlance, Abraham was a Muslim. Then um, the stars themselves, just like all the other beings, the mountains, the trees, and so on, they all worship Allah. And it is also said that the sun and the moon are not to be worshipped. They are only signs of what is to be really worshipped, namely Allah. Then um, to make sure that nobody mistakes Islam for a sun cult, he uh, changes a few things. He inverts the circumambulation of the Kaaba. You see, normally the circumambulation of the Kaaba, which is still being done by Muslims on pilgrimage to Mecca, is in the same sense as in which planets turn around the sun. If you look from the northern hemisphere, it is clockwise. In fact, that's why, where the clockwise direction comes from. And so you have your right hand towards the object of worship, in this case, the Kaaba. In Sanskrit, this is called Pradakshina. So you hold your Dakshina, your right hand, to the object of worship. Now, he inverted this to make sure that nobody would make the connotation with um, the, the seeming movement of the stars around the earth. Um, so he inverts this direction so that now you have to walk around the Kaaba with your left hand towards the Kaaba, which happens to be your profane hand in, in most cultures. But anyway, that he took in stride. There are five prayers in every day for the Muslim. Now, Muhammad made sure that one of these five is at night so that you can't get the impression that you are worshiping the sun. Then in the year, you have one solar year corresponding to 12 lunar months plus a few days, 11 days. So in most calendars in the world, in the Hindu calendar, in the Babylonian calendar, which still exists as the Jewish calendar, in the Chinese calendar, and so on, uh, you have the principle of an 
intercalary month. So a year lasts 12 lunar months, but then you have 11 days extra. The next year you have 22 days extra. And then the third year you have more than a month extra. So what do you do? You intercalate a 13th month. So what this means in practice is that every 19 years, there are seven years when you put in an extra month. And so that way, the lunar year, consisting of either 12 or 13 lunar months, can keep thread with the uh, solar year. However, Muhammad abolishes this 13th month uh, because here he associates it with moon worship. And he's very distrustful of this, this number 13. So he abolishes this, which is why now you have the situation where every year is 11 days shorter than the real year. And so all the feasts of uh, the Islamic year can fall in any time of the year. Like the fasting month, Ramadan, can fall in the extremely hot Saudi summer, or it can also fall in the middle of winter. You know, you have also Muslims in, like, let's say, in, uh, in Kazan in Russia, or in nowadays in Scotland, for example, uh, which is like uh, 57 or so degrees north, uh, where you have very short days very long nights in winter or the reverse in summer. And so it, it makes fasting a really harrowing experience, very unnatural. But so that all follows from Muhammad's uh, emphasis that what he practiced, that his religion was not a form of sun worship or moon worship. So shirk is the uh, worst sin in Islam. It's an association of a creature with the creator. In Catholicism, you have the same principle, but not so pointedly, not so emphatically. Like you see with Mary, you know, sometimes Hindus who make comparison with other religions say quite correctly that the cult of the Virgin Mary in Catholicism is really goddess worship in disguise. That's effectively what it is for most common people who go on pilgrimage to the sacred sites of the Virgin Mary, to Lourdes in France and so on. Uh, but for theologians, that's not okay. You see, they insist that Mary is not worshipped. She is venerated, but she is not worshipped because she is not divine. Okay, And so similarly, Muslims should not worship Muhammad. They can glorify Muhammad all they want. They, they, they name their first son Muhammad. And, and so this way they honor Muhammad, but they don't worship him. That's why they object to the, uh, to the name Mohammedanism. They are not Mohammedans the way Christians you know, worship Christ. They do not worship Muhammad. So they prefer the name Muslim. In the Quran, it is said that Allah is not engendered and has not engendered. So he, he has not been created. And he doesn't create in the sense that human beings create a next generation. You see, procreation is below his dignity. God is the totally other. So he has no link with stars or men or any other being. Men, of course, have a link with stars in the sense that they're both creatures. They both follow the same laws of nature. And so they have quite a bit in common. That's why you shouldn't worship them. You know, just like you don't worship yourself. You can take good care of yourself and, you know, you can be self-conscious in the sense of knowing your own qualities, your own virtues, but also knowing your own shortcomings. But nevertheless, you don't worship yourself. And so you don't worship other beings, you don't worship the stars. Only Allah who should be worshipped. So that's why shirk in Islam is condemned. Whereas shirk has a long pedigree. We've traced it back to Ugarit, 
which is twice as long ago as Muhammad. And it can certainly be traced back to the cavemen, to the Neanderthals and so on. So it's a very old religious principle, but in Islam it is uh, tabooed. Thank you. Namaste, Kyonadels uh, ji uh, and the Sangam team. Thank you so much. Uh, a bit of uh, how this transition happened from uh, polytheism, just for the sake of uh, brevity, I'm calling it polytheism uh, for all forms of uh, yeah. worship and uh, um, I mean, not uh, star and all that. And how this transition from polytheism to rigid monotheism is not clear. Or rather, I, it did not come clearly in the presentation. Uh, the reason being uh, that this idea of uh, the gods and the higher and higher and the highest gods has been there in every religion, including in Hinduism. And uh, for instance, you mentioned Chinese religion. They have the concept of Shanti, but they also have the concept of Bufang uh, Shanti, which is the highest uh, god. And uh, similarly, they have the uh, concept of incarnations uh, manifestation manifested of the highest God. For instance, the cult of the Yellow Emperor, which is almost similar to the cult of Ram. So uh, uh, similarly, in the Middle East uh, region where Islam did come up, uh, there were concepts of uh, there was the concept of gods and there was the concept of heaven uh, as a matter of fact as you rightly point out it was very closely associated with star worship because shanti is also actually the uh, you know it's a particular star position from the little bear to the um, uh, the saptarshi so uh, that is also uh, the symbol of the heavens so all these things were there in the middle east also however monotheism also existed in the Middle East before Islam. And as a matter of fact, this form of monotheism came in conflict with the Trinitarianism of the uh, Trinitarianism of the Byzantine uh, uh, Empire, the Byzantine Christianity at that time. So uh, Islam actually took over the, when Islam started taking over the form of extreme monotheism, uh, is it by any chance more to do with the conflict with the Byzantine emperor, uh, Empire, which came subsequent to Muhammad? Or how exactly did this transition from this polytheism to monotheism happen? This is what I want to have more clearly. Well, let's start at the beginning. So the, the first monotheist that we know of is uh, the pharaoh Echnaton which is about 1400 BC. And it's about the time of Moses. There is a connection between Moses and Echnaton. We don't know yet exactly how it is, but clearly Moses was part of that same movement. Now it, um, it starts with um, a form of sun worship that falls short of what is later demanded by monotheists uh, because he still takes uh, what really is a creature though a very powerful creature namely the sun and so he worships that and so he leaves out the worship of all other gods then later what uh, what moses does or what yahweh does according to the bible when he gives the ten commandments is that he demands to be worshipped exclusively, so to the exclusion of all other gods, but there is no denial of the other gods' existence yet. So it's a step towards monotheism, but it's not strictly monotheism yet. Max Müller coined here the term henotheism. So heno, henotheism comes from Greek heis, which means one, whereas monotheism uh, comes from monos, which means one alone. So if you worship one God to the exclusion of all others, that's henotheism. 
And so that's the, the initial conception of uh, monotheism in the Ten Commandments. But so when you don't believe in the other gods anymore, then you get monotheism. But so that's a, that's a long process. In Israel, they have to fight for centuries against the recurring te tendency to worship many gods. Like that's why you have the rule of endogamy. So the idea is that Jews can't marry non-Jews unless they convert uh, because the initial reason is because that would expose them to the uh, temptation of worshiping other gods. The gods that their foreign wife brings into the home, you see, might tempt you to worship them. Um, then it is mainly the um, Babylonian captivity that is the breaking point when from henotheism you really introduce monotheism. So this is the sixth century BC. So already before that you have a few kings who are militant for uh, monotheism who go for it, but it doesn't really succeed yet. So from then on you really get monotheist uh, Judaism. And uh, so then the Bible is also rewritten to conform with that, but you have many remnants of henotheism in, in the Bible, like the name Lord of Hosts. You know, the hosts means the heavenly host, the stars. So the Lord of the stars, who just like an army, parade every night in front of you from east to west. That's the host. So. The Lord of those, you see, first, initially, it means the, the one most conspicuous among them, but gradually it means the creator behind all of them. And so that's a, that's a gradual development. Later, of course, when you get conversions on a large scale, then you have to, you have many people who at once have to make the shift. And so they have to abandon all the gods that they used to worship in favor of the only one. As for the only one, um, in many religions, there is a certain coexistence between the two because you have a God on top of the pantheon. Like for instance, in, in, in the Roman religion, shortly before Christianization, um, the word Jupiter or Zeus in, in, in Greek, is often already used more or less with the same connotations as the Christian God. You know, where this really means the God, the dispenser of everything and so on, uh, who is above uh, all the others. Uh, but so, you know, that is again part of the, 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 the process of, you know, a shift from uh, polytheism towards, uh, towards monotheism. And so upon conversion, the idea is that, yes, you know, here you have to hurt yourself, the short pain, you just burn everything uh, that reminds you of the many gods. Like when uh, Clovis, uh, king of our own country, um, in 496 converted to Christianity from Germanic paganism, his baptism father told him, okay, now burn what you worshipped and worship what you burned. So in, in, in the case of conversion uh, of polytheism to one of the monotheisms, uh, this is a very radical, uh, and hurtful uh, procedure or joyous procedure when you really are convinced that the new God is really the true God. Now, what does uh, Muhammad have to do with this? Uh, he was already strongly under the influence of Christianity, but in Christianity you had different strands. So the one that won became the Catholic religion, uh, of which Byzantine was also still a part at that time the schism between Catholicism and Orthodoxy only took place in the 11th century. But so that was Trinitarian Christianity. 
So that was already a bit of an aberration from the biblical monotheism. In the first centuries of Christianity, there were all kinds of tendencies. You know, it was far more diverse than Christianity is now. And um, so there were many who were polytheistic, you know, who believed in Christ, but who did not limit God to just one person. And um, so you had all kinds of tendencies. And so the one that won through was Trinitarian Christianity. So you have the Father, which is God. Then you have the Son, who is also God, but in the incarnation of, uh, as a man. And then you have the Holy Spirit more properly called the Holy Ghost. That term Holy Spirit is a modern thing. You know, traditionally they called him the Holy Ghost. And so the belief in ghosts was very prominent. Jesus was an exorcist who drove out ghosts. So the Holy Ghost is also very much a person. And so you have this, uh, this scheme, which I, I find very profound, by the way, um, namely, that the Father is the Son, the Son is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is the Father, um, in the sense that they are all three emanations of God, of the divine, and yet they are not equal to one another. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is not the Father. And so you have this this strange logic where things are, you know, where equality is not transitive, if I may use mathematical terminology. Anyway, so that's a, that's a mystery, you know, when, when you get too, um, too curious, when you ask Christians too much about this, they end up saying, oh, but it's, it's a mystery. Yes. Anyway, so not all Christians believe this. You have the monophysites, which still survive as the Copts in Egypt, who believe in only God. They're pure monotheists, and they believe that Jesus was really God, which is that he's not human. So he didn't suffer on the cross, because suffering is not, is not divine, and so on. So they have this strange conception of who Jesus was. Then you have the opposite tendency, the Aryans, and I don't mean the Aryans in the sense of the Aryan invasion theory. No, the followers of the Bishop Arius, who believed that Jesus was just a man. Okay, he was a special man and an important man and so on, but he was just a man. And so they still believe in only one God. So this same tendency also had in the east, to the east of the Byzantine Empire. And uh, that is what is called anti-Trinitarian Christianity. Now, this um, tendency was very much in the air uh, at the time of Muhammad. And so Islam really starts as an assertion of this non-Trinitarian Christianity. That's why there is so much of Jesus Christ in the Quran. Muhammad is named only four times, and it's not even sure that the word Muhammad every time refers to the prophet. You see, Muhammad is just an Arab, Arabic word, which means praised, the praised one. Yeah, but Jesus is mentioned many times, and many ideas about Jesus that we know from Christianity are still there. Like Jesus is born from a virgin. However, he was not resurrected. You see, being more than mortal, being immortal, that would be a divine thing, whereas Jesus was just a human being. And so, you see, if the cross played any role, either he didn't die, which might be suggested, in fact, by the gospel text itself. You see, normally they broke the bones of people who had been hanging on the cross, and they didn't do that in the case of Jesus. It's said explicitly in the gospel. So maybe the Romans thought, you know, played a prank on the Jews by not having Jesus die. Who knows? Who knows? This is one possibility, just purely speculative. At any rate, this is an idea. Jesus didn't die on the cross. Or if somebody died, it was a stand-in. It was a doppelganger. Uh, it was not really Jesus himself. At any rate, there is no such thing as the resurrection. Um, 
you know, from there to full Islam is not a big step anymore. Like for instance, you don't change, you don't replace Jesus with Muhammad. You see, because Muhammad absolutely is a human being. You know, there's no worship of Muhammad the way Christians worship Jesus. And so you see the the evolution in in um, towards a full Islam is a is a gradual one. And so yes, you see, of course, by that time, monotheism is is very much present and is understood in its implications. Like among the Arab pagans, you also have a tendency to monotheism. You see, on the one hand, you have the people in Mecca who still worship all the gods. You have a tendency, especially in the south of Arabia, where you see these gods disappear, you know, in the texts which used to contain the worship of Hubal and Allah and Uzza and so on. These other gods tend to not be mentioned anymore. And so, you know, who is mentioned is Rahman or Al Rahman, the um, uh, the compassionate one, which is one of the epithets of Allah. So, without Muhammad, you know, but th that tendency to monotheism is very strong. And you see the same thing in India with the Arya Samaj that you see keeps up Hinduism, that in fact wants to protect Hinduism against conversion to Islam or to especially at that time Christianity, um, but nevertheless takes over the idea of monotheism. And so in some of the Arya Samaj translations of the Veda, you don't have Agni this and Indra that and so on. No, there's only God this and God that and God that, you know. So they pretend that the apparent polytheism in the Veda really hides monotheism. Uh, and in fact, they have a Vedic uh, justification for it. There is this verse by Dir Gautamas in the first book, Hymn 164, very famous verse, Ekam Sad Vipa Vipra Bahudha Vadanti. The sages call the one reality by many names. And so, you see, they take as consequence, well, all the many names we have of Indra and Agni and Vayu and so on are really only one goal. Um, so this, this tendency to monotheism is quite strong. I mean, you know, it's like other ideologies that at some point are very strong and are taken over by everyone. Like, for instance, in politics, socialism was practically a matter of consensus by around 1970, when some, I think some British conservatives, conservative politicians said, we are all socialists now. Because at that time, you see, even the opponents of socialism nevertheless took over many socialist ideas. And so that, that's when you, you see that an idea is going strong, that it's dominant. So monotheism, likewise, you know, was already the dominant thing, the, the upcoming thing in the decades before Muhammad, just as it was in the cultural circles of, of Swami Dayan Saraswati in the 19th century. So, you see, mon monotheism is a very drastic novelty for people who are converted at knife point. But in the longer history of religions, it's a gradual, uh, gradual shift. Is that an answer to your question? Thank you, Dr. Elst. I mean, this answers it very expansively, um, the question which I had also in mind. My point, question was, however, if I may elaborate a little bit from the historical point of view, yeah. because one thing is known that the Quran itself uh, has been compiled at least a hundred years after the time of Muhammad. And that wow. was the time actually when the Arab tribes and the other monotheist uh, tribes, non-Arabs, uh, were actually coming into conflict with the Byzantine Empire, the Byzantine mm -hmm. uh, sphere of influence. So uh, historically, in terms of timeline, probably I uh, wanted to know that was it actually a consequence of that that it came into an from a henotheistic uh, um, uh, belief system into a you know a very extreme form of monotheism because well, um, mm -hmm. that from the historical point of view from the timeline point of view yes okay no i'm all for the historical point of view 
I mean, it's about time that we demystify religions and, you know, start seeing what really has happened historically. Now, uh, there is a German revisionist school, which by now has, you know, has gained a following in, in all the other countries also, um, which uh, says that the history of Islam is quite different from the the, the the version that Muslims themselves give. So Muslims say, okay, first you have God, then God creates the world. And at some moment, which only God knows why, he decides to send the Quran down to earth. The Quran has already existed in the bosom of God since, since before creation. And so he sends it down to a prophet. Then a religion is founded around that book. And then an empire is founded around that religion, namely the caliphate. And in fact, what happened is exactly the, the opposite. First, you have an empire, and we'll, come, we'll explain also where that empire comes from. But so first you have an empire, then the Arabs used to work as mercenaries for both the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire, who were at war with one another very frequently. And so they knew that a serious empire has a state religion, Zoroastrianism in the case of Persia and Christianity in the case of the Byzantines. So they need a state religion. And so they cobble one together, mostly from the Christianity that they knew as mercenaries for the Byzantines. And then to have their religion taken seriously, well, they know that the state religions also had a book, either the Avesta or the Bible. And to make that book serious, it has to come from God. And so if it has to come from God, it has to come through a prophet. So the next thing they invent is a prophet. So you have first the empire, then the religion, then the book, then the prophet. Hmm? Now, where does, and that's why the life of Muhammad is only written a century and a half after the death of Muhammad. Uh, so, which doesn't mean that nothing of it is historical. Probably there has been a human being who more or less had the experiences ascribed to Muhammad, but nevertheless, his uh, status as prophet and so on, that's all very doubtful. Um, but so this, it's this empire that needed this, uh, this construction. Now, where does that empire come from? And here we have to look again at history. In the beginning of the seventh century, there was a big war between the Persian and the Byzantine empire, which the Persian empire was winning. Then there is this genius Heraclius who becomes the emperor in Byzantine. He does a number of political things that um, make it possible for him to reorganize the army to, um, to make all kinds of military progress so that suddenly he defeats the Persian army and totally annihilates it. But this happens at a far corner of the two empires in Armenia, whereas in the population centers in the Middle East, everything is under control of their Arab uh, mercenaries. And so at that point, the mercenaries start for themselves. This is 622, which not coincidentally is the beginning of the Muslim calendar. So originally what this is, is simply the Arab calendar. This is when their empire starts. And so you see in, 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 in India, for instance, very many dates in history are only known as year 75 of the Gahadwala dynasty, you know, year number 100 of the um, whichever, um, you know, the Maurya dynasty and so on. So this is the same thing. They start a new calendar when they start a new regime. And um, then initially, you see, they are still stuck with this kind of Christianity, which is already different from the Christianity practiced in, um, in Byzantine. But so then 
they have been the mercenaries of the Byzantines, employees of the Byzantines, but gradually the power equation is such that now the Byzantines become their principal enemies. And so that creates the right atmosphere for radicalizing the religious difference between them. And so they're not really Christians anymore. For, for Christians, you see this non-Trinitarian Christianity is so-so. They don't recognize Jesus as divine. So for them, these are not Christians anymore. And so for the Muslims themselves, it becomes easy. It's only a small step to set up a new religion. And so then it is, uh, you see the, the first uh, main caliphate, the Umayyad caliphate in Damascus is still halfway. Damascus is also a Christian city and so on. It's mainly with the start of the Abbasids that you get real Islamization. Um, yeah. This is from Saurav Rohila. He asks, how do you view the book Ventures of Islam and the way its popularity increased? How do, you have, do I view which book? The book Ventures. The book, I, I believe he means the Quran. Is that ah. right, Saurav Rohila? Ventures of Islam itself is the name of the book and the writer of that book is uh, and the writer of that book is Marshall Hertzgan. Okay, so Book Ventures of Islam is the name of a book. Yeah. By no, Marshall? I, I, yes, I don't think I know this book. Could you summarize what it says? Marshall Hertzgan. Hmm? So he's asking if you could summarize or just uh, specify about something about the book. He doesn't know about the book. Mm -hmm. Never so heard from it. That. We can but, skip uh, that. I mean, I suppose it is uh, one of the um, rather numerous uh, attempts to rewrite the, the genesis of Islam. Um, I mean, there are, you know, if, if you look at it closely, and this started with uh, the Danish-British uh, Islamologist Patricia Krohn in the 90s, who at one point said that Muhammad never existed. Later, she reverted about that. But at any rate, she completely changed the early history of Islam. Like she said that, you see, Mecca could not be Mecca. And then later, you get this Canadian archaeologist, uh, Dan Gibson, who shows from archaeology that in Mecca, there was nothing. There was no city of Mecca. Um, it uh, only started when a rebel against the Umayyad dynasty um, captured the black stone and took it with him and planted it in, in, in the desert where there was nothing. And that's why when you now excavate in Mecca, you find nothing. You see, if you excavate in Varanasi or some other old city, you find lots of things. You know, even if it's an amateurish digging, like when you build a new building, first the building company has to dig a big hole. And so all kinds of objects come to light, not according to the rules of stratification and so on, but nevertheless, they're there. And so in Mecca, this is not the case. You know, there have been enormous works, all kinds of buildings have been built around the Kaaba, and there's nothing. And so he says, the real Mecca is Petra, the city in Jordan. Jordan. And so he has plenty of evidence, you know, I uh, refer to his own, um, his own uh, videos about this. Yeah, and yeah, one thing that I, I have to say in, in this context, the Qibla, the direction of prayer in the first about 50 years of Islam is towards Petra. And it's only then that it changes and gets reoriented towards Mecca because uh, there's uh, like a thousand miles between them. It makes a big difference. Um, so, I mean, that's only one of the, of the ways in which uh, right now um, early Islamic history is being revised. And so there is a, well, terrible protest against this from the side of Muslims. 
but I think it's inevitable. You see, in, in the 19th century and then continuing until now, you have a revision of Christianity. And so you have critical study of the Bible and so on. Um, and so now that is being reapplied to the Quran. And it turns out that there's lots to revise in the case of early Islamic history. So this in general, I mean, each of these topics are of course worth a, a study in its own right. But so in general, this much I can say that uh, Islamic history is seriously different from what the tradition says.